Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Anne. Go ahead and scoot in just a little tiny bit. There we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Perfect. So you are running for California District 21, which if I can get this logistically in my mind, it's Merced and some of Stanislaus County. But for the listeners, can you give them a direct map for so that if they're not quite sure, if they haven't quite opened up that mail-in ballot, sure. they know exactly, you know, where you're at. Well, that's right. I, I, uh, I'm running for the 21st Assembly District, and it uh, encompasses all of Merced County in its entirety, the communities of Los Banos and uh, Merced, uh, Livingston, uh, Planada, uh, comes up into Stanislaus County and uh, encompasses primarily the west side, uh, almost divides along the 99. Mm -hmm. It gets uh, Patterson, uh, Newman, uh, it also gets all of Ceres, about a third of Modesto. More specifically, if you're west of uh, Oakdale Road and south of Briggsmore, there's a pretty good chance uh, that you're in the district. It goes skirts around Turlock. that ha does have some uh, outlying uh, homes in the Turlock area, but primarily misses most of uh, the city of Turlock. So Modesto Series, uh, Patterson, and Newman are uh, the communities in Stanislaus County that uh, are in the district. It's interesting how they, when they redistricted uh, in 2012, that it was, it's very different. I mean, well, 2010 because of the census. But instead of like taking a whole county here and a whole county here, it's like they took this and a little bit of that. Can you explain why they do that? Well, it all revolves around uh, the census and population growth. Uh, every 10 years when we do the census and we get the new uh, information, uh, then the legislative uh, seats have to be adjusted so that they all have equal uh, population in them. Uh, an assembly seat at this time uh, after this census is roughly uh, 500,000 people in it. Uh, in order to do that, it doesn't always fit into whole counties. Uh, in the case of our seat, uh, I'm certainly pleased that Merced County was uh, maintained in its uh, entirety. Stanislaus County would have been too big to have both counties together in one uh, seat. And in fact, Stanislaus County is going to have two representatives in the state assembly. Uh, I'll have the western portion uh, if we win this election. And Kristen Olson uh, is likely to represent the eastern portion of Stanislaus County. So uh, it's just driven by population. Certainly it would be nice uh, if each uh, county uh, could be maintained uh, in its entirety. But of course, uh, it's important that all seats have the same population mm -hmm. so that we all have an equal opportunity to be represented. Certainly uh, wouldn't be fair uh, otherwise. Another thing that's important, too, when looking at the redistricting is having the right amount of uh, like the municipal um, uh, now advisory committees to have the MAC committees to make sure that each one has the same amount and and the community events as well. So there's a lot that goes into that redistricting as well as population. So right. so each person within your district is getting a fair representation in the state. It's exactly. not like some you know they have to share their representative with you know, a million people and others only 10,000, so. Well, there's a number of factors, communities of interest, mm -hmm. uh, geographic uh, uh, commonality. And right. So the, in this year was interesting because it's the first year ever that the Citizens Commission uh, was in charge of the redistricting. Uh, in prior years, it's right. always been the legislature right. itself that's right. done redistricting. And uh, the complaint that was often levied against them uh, was that they took the interest of the incumbents, uh, really in all parties, into consideration when they drew the seats uh, so as not to move somebody out. So this year with the Citizens Commission doing it, uh, that was no longer uh, a factor uh, in the determination of how they would draw the seats and uh, some folks advocated for that. They thought it would be a, a fair way to approach redistricting and uh, it certainly uh, has worked out I think in a fashion that's good for our community. So you think it is, uh, it's a more fair process the way they did it this time than in the past? Is that what you're saying? I think so. And for example, in our seat, uh, which used to uh, go all the way up into San Joaquin County, uh, had portions of the west side of Stanislaus, had Tracy and Stockton that's right. and all of that's Merced. Right. Yeah. Uh, that's the seat that I'm running in that's now been compacted mm -hmm. to just Merced and Stanislaus County. And I think the more compact uh, any legislative seat uh, can be, uh, the more common uh, the communities are going to have, uh, the more the communities are going to have in common uh, so as to allow someone to represent them, I think, in a, in a better fashion. And it's very similar, frankly. I don't know if you recall uh, the redistricting that was done in the early 90s uh, when, at that time, Dennis Cardozo served us in the uh, State Assembly. Uh, 
that was a seat that in, uh, encompassed all of Merced mm -hmm. and the cities of Turlock, Ceres, Modesto, and the West Side. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar to that, and that was one that was actually drawn by the courts. If you go back and look at how that played out, the legislature drew seats, uh, somebody sued that they were not uh, drawn in a fair fashion, the courts intervened and redrew the seats, uh, and that's what we got. So we're back to a seat very similar to that. Uh, I think it uh, geographically makes sense. I like the more compact nature. I think Stanislaus and Merced County have a great deal in common, uh, and it's a great uh, district to have the opportunity to represent. Speaking of uh, being compact and kind of having the same interests within a geographical location, mm -hmm. I'm going to switch gears here for a minute and tell you that I've been receiving some flyers for your campaign, and I see an awful lot of cows on those flyers. <laughs> so what's up with all the cows? <laughs> There has been uh, some flyers with cows on them, not actually coming from my campaign, uh, but some that have been done in support of my campaign. And, uh, you know, I grew up in Merced. My family uh, was involved in the dairy industry. Uh, my grandfather started a feed store. It's called Merced Dairy Supply Company. And it was both a feed store and an equipment sales company. Uh, my father worked there. Uh, I worked there, put myself through school uh, working there. And it was a great experience. And uh, during the course of this campaign, some folks have uh, highlighted that, my kind of background in agriculture and, uh, and hard work, and used that as a, a selling point for our campaign. But uh, that's certainly been some, uh, somewhat fun for my father and the family. So. Well, that kind of explains it, because it's like I didn't know any of that background about you at all. I just knew that you had worked in Sacramento. So when I saw all these cows showing up, it's like, whoa, you know? <laughs> are you a local guy? <laughs> so you, were you born and raised here? I was born and raised in uh, Merced County, uh, born in, in uh, Merced. Um, went to grade school there, middle school there, high school there, uh, both Merced High and Golden Valley High, uh, of which I was in the first graduating class in 1996, uh, attended Merced College then went on to uh, UC Santa Barbara. After uh, UC Santa Barbara, I was able to come home and at that time uh, go to work with Dennis Cardoza, who was a, uh, our state assembly member uh, in my hometown. And I had done some internships uh, with our congressman at that time, Gary Condon, uh, who happens to now be my father-in-law. But uh, you know, got involved in politics at a local level that way. Uh, also with uh, serving on some local commissions, uh, involved with the church, involved with some uh, ministry the homeless and, and other activities and uh, all that led to a career in public service that spanned a little over 10 years uh, working in Merced, in Turlock, uh, in Fresno, uh, and in the state capitol. What were some of the commissions that you worked on? Uh, we did a uh, Save the Library Commission. I worked on the uh, Sierra Saving Grace Homeless uh, Project uh, Board. Uh, that was through uh, our church it was a nonprofit that spun off to take medically needy homeless off the streets in order to uh, accomplish two things, obviously uh, serve the poor, but at the same time uh, create some savings for uh, local government. Uh, you know, we spend a great deal of money when homeless folks uh, go into our emergency rooms and get care. And uh, by taking private grant money and helping these folks get off the streets, get into uh, safe homes, and get onto consistent care, uh, you can greatly reduce the obligations to the county and the city that uh, all of us taxpayers are footing the bill uh, and also help somebody out at the same time uh, and change their life. So that was a lot of fun uh, to be involved with. I was also involved with the Merced Simono Sister City Project, uh, which was a uh, sister city program uh, between Simoto, Nicaragua, uh, and the city of Merced where I grew up. So I uh, had the chance to be involved in the community in another, a number of ways, uh, not the least of which was working with the folks that represent us and working on important projects like UC Merced, uh, important projects like the tractor tax, which we got tax relief for our farmers here in the valley. Uh, things that have, I think, done a lot to improve our community, and I hope that I get the opportunity to carry that work on in the capacity as our representative in the State Assembly. How long did you work on any particular one of those commissions? Uh, six months, five years? I, I'm unfamiliar with how long you can intern for something like that. Most of the, the internships I did uh, as, a, as a young person uh, were, for example, a summer internship of uh, three months. Some of those uh, commissions and organizations that I mentioned I've been involved with over the last 15 years. Uh, some of them as much as 15 and some of them uh, in a lesser capacity of a year or two. Uh, and then, of course, the internships uh, were short-lived short and my career uh, 
with the state was, as I said, a little over 10 years. And what did, exactly did you do when you worked uh, with Dennis Cardoza? Well, at the time when I started, he was the chair of the Ag Committee, so I uh, got the opportunity to work on agricultural policy uh, up in uh, Sacramento and, and here locally. Uh, he went on to uh, hold a number of leadership positions, and I acted in the capacity as a legislative aide, uh, helping him with public safety policy, uh, certainly monitoring the activities at UC Merced and trying to get the campus uh, built and funded. Uh, which is a goal that's been accomplished. And that's something that legislators in our area have worked on for <clears throat> the better part of three decades. I mean, really going back to when Tony Aquilo was our congressman, mm -hmm. uh, and the idea was uh, you know, put in place that a 10th University of California campus was going to be built, uh, nobody knew where. So communities throughout California competed. It was narrowed down to a handful of locations in the Central Valley. Uh, and folks like Gary Condit, uh, Dick Monteith, uh, Dennis Cardoza, uh, and others, Sal Canella, all worked collaboratively, like I said, over the span of really three decades. I was lucky enough to be working with Dennis uh, at a time when the campus actually got sited and uh, buildings went up and uh, students showed up. Uh, we now have a student population, I think around 5,500 students. Uh, it's been great for the community. It's been a, the economic uh, you know, factor it's played as far as uh, spending in the community has been wonderful. Uh, having uh, students graduate and start business has been wonderful, uh, and it's really a, a bright spot in an otherwise, uh, you know, pretty uh, damaging economic conditions that we've all suffered here, uh, not just in Merced County, but here in Stanislaus County, uh, Madera, Fresno County. We've seen some of the highest unemployment rates, rates of poverty uh, in the nation, certainly some of the highest foreclosure rates. So I think to have UC Merced uh, in a position to provide economic growth uh, an opportunity for the future and for our kids is a really exciting thing. I've heard it said that our successes are built on the shoulders of giants. Mm -hmm. Are you going to be one of the giants now for future generations to build their success on? Well, I just hope I can give back. Uh, you know, if I can give back in a way that's uh, half as much as some of those folks I've mentioned, uh, I'd certainly be pleased with uh, my career uh, in public service and my opportunity. Uh, in public service. Uh, but I am excited about the chance to carry on some of this work. I mean, this is, these are big, uh, long-term uh, investments in our community that really can stand to make a difference. You know, I think uh, one of the challenges I've seen with a term-limited uh, legislature is folks come and go, uh, you know, every six years uh, as their maximum term without getting the opportunity to think about those long-term investments, right? Uh, how are we going to invest in infrastructure uh, in water, in power, in renewable energy, uh, in universities, uh, things that take a great deal longer uh, than, you know, six years to build, to accomplish, to move through the legislative process. Uh, I'm excited that I can, I guess, pick up the ball and move it five yards further, uh, you know, as, as our representative, because it's together that we... Uh, the studio lights are yeah, very the studio hot. studio lights are getting a lot I think we need a little air conditioner in here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, just to be part of it. I know I'm not uh, asking real tough questions, so it's just really hot in no, here. No, <laughs> no, it is just uh, those lights are gone. But uh, just to be part of it, to give back uh, in some capacity and, and to uh, continue that work, because I think it's important uh, that we finish the work of the folks that have been there uh, before us. We need to think long term. I have a good friend who used to say, we need government to do the things that we can't do for ourselves, right? I can, uh, for example, take my kid to piano lessons, but I can't build a police station or pay for a police force, you know, or have uh, a fire station or uh, pay for a school. Those are things that we have to do together as a community, and, uh, and that's really uh, what government's there to do as we come together, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Green Party members, to make a safer, uh, better community and better future for uh, our kids and our neighbors and our, our uh, families. Speaking of long term, are you in it for the long haul? In other words, are you running for office just for this one term? Or if you get in there and you need to run again, would you run again and keep representing the people here in District 21? I think uh, I'm in it to make a difference. Uh, I'm in it to you know, make sure that UC Merced goes from a campus of 5,000 to a campus of 25,000. Make sure that our unemployment rate drops from 18% to 
9% or 8% or 7% uh, to make sure uh, that we as a community are well educated, are safe. Uh, these are the things I want living here. These are the things my family uh, wants that I want for uh, my family. Uh, and we all want. So we got to work together. I want to give back in whatever capacity I can. I have the unique uh, experience of having worked with the legislature, worked with some of these folks who have represented us, uh, kind of understanding uh, their vision and uh, wanting to carry that out. Uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, I will serve as long as I can uh, help and make a difference. Uh, certainly, I, what I want to, what I'm asking the voters for tomorrow uh, is an opportunity to serve in the state legislature for two years, uh, to work hard on behalf of my community, and I hope they uh, they honor me with that opportunity, and I'll show that I've done a good job and. Uh, hopefully improve things uh, in our everyday lives. Here's a kind of a personal question, not for you, but for me. Yeah. You were talking about being safe, mm -hmm. and I think you were speaking specifically about public safety and firefighters, and I know that you have a lot of their support. But my question is about air quality, mm -hmm. and you worked with Dennis Cardoza on the Ag uh, Committee, and in the, you've grown up in the agricultural community. We have a lot of issues going on here in the Central Valley concerning air quality, not just the smog blowing in from the Bay Area, but also what is being stirred up from the dust mm -hmm. and the insecticides, the fungicides, mm -hmm. the herbicides. All of these sides are becoming very det detrimental to the people in the Central Valley. How do you see serving in the state legislature helping make the air quality our basic need in life. I mean, we, we can live without food for three or four days or a few weeks, mm -hmm. but we can't live without more than three minutes without air. Well, I think we're, we've made some important strides uh, in air quality, um, and there's a long way to go. We've seen... Uh, How so? Uh, we've, see, we've seen... Uh, well, I, I want small specifics. check, too. Um, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the agricultural. Yeah, how to yeah. They've, uh, they've made use of uh, you know, water-wise techniques that uh, keep dust down. They've uh, had efforts by the Air Resource Board to uh, regulate some equipment. Uh, we have things like methane digesters uh, that, you know, with the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. There's multiple efforts in the different uh, sections of the agricultural economy uh, to use technology uh, to have less of this uh, particulate matter and air pollution. Um, at the same time, though, you know, we also have to uh, think long-term about investments in uh, transportation changes. You know, we move uh, a lot of our ag product by diesel truck. Mm -hmm. uh, we move that on the I-5 and the 99, which also uh, serve as the main uh, connectors between the two major urban areas mm -hmm. in the Bay Area and L.A. Uh, the, pop the population uh, here in California is going to close to double by 2040, 2050. Well, uh, that's why I'm asking, when you get into the state assembly up here, am I going to be able to give you a call and say, hey, I can't breathe. Can mm -hmm. you please take something before the assembly and say, we got to improve the air quality here in the Central Valley? Well, where, where I was going with that is what we do, both with our agricultural economy and with our transportation mm -hmm. infrastructure here in the Valley, is we serve the entire state. And really, the entire state needs to be involved uh, in the cleanup process. And we need to do that uh, by getting uh, cars and trucks off the road. Now we can't, you know, dampen the economy by uh, putting truckers out of business and farmers out of business. You know, we've got 18% unemployment rate as is, so we don't need to do more of that. Uh, but what we can do is take some of these urban travelers out of the valley, uh, off of the road. I think, you know, that's one of the reasons you've seen uh, folks advocate for high-speed rail. You know, you've, let's move people off of the roads into the trains from the urban areas so that our uh, transportation infrastructure can exist to move product uh, and clean up the air at the same time, you know, as the population's doubling. So there are efforts underway uh, to mitigate some of that pollution, uh, and we have to send someone to Sacramento who's going to continue to support those projects. And you are a supporter of the high-speed rail? Support of the high-speed rail, support methane digesters, which is, there's been a state-subsidized mm -hmm. program to help dairymen with that. There are uh, ways to help, but we need folks that are going to get in there, uh, first understand the issue, mm -hmm. and then secondly, I mean, there are those that say, oh, we don't have an air quality problem. I heard my opponent say it at our last debate. Well, I, you know, that's not true. That's not the facts. We do have an air quality problem. Does that mean we should uh, shut down farms? No, absolutely not. Does it mean we should figure out ways 
uh, either through technology or investments in transportation infrastructure to improve uh, the air? Absolutely. What do you think about the smog rolling in from the Bay Area and then the Central Valley is actually fined for having poor air quality? Do you think that the Central Valley should then send a bill to the Bay Area and say, hey, you know, you got to help us pay this $27 million fine? Well, I, I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. In, uh, you know, we produce food for the entire state and the entire world. Uh, we produce, we, you know, we uh, are a transportation corridor for the entire state. Uh, so everybody needs to participate uh, to the extent that there's a cost to the cleanup. Everybody needs to participate. And I'll certainly uh, go you know, to Sacramento and fight uh, with the Bay Area folks and the LA folks till we get everybody bought in uh, on a uh, solution that uh, sh you know, everyone shares and bears a little bit of weight. What do you think about the water issues going on here uh, in Modesto specifically about people wanting our water and mm -hmm. now Southern California mm -hmm. what do you think do you think that all of the California's resources need to be shared with all of California or do you think each county or each district has their specialty and they can either sell or not sell and they don't need to be browbeaten by another district and say you have to share because you're part of California where do you stand on that? Well, I you know, stand first and foremost in protecting our water uh, and our interests here at home. You know, and, and in a representative democracy, when we go up to represent our communities, the first thing on our mind with every vote ought to be our community. Uh, the second thing on our mind ought to be the entire community of the state, uh, as we all are you know, for a good state. And we also ought to have uh, the entire country on our mind. But first and foremost, you take care of home. We've got some of the best uh, you know, water rights and water uh, opportunities here in Merced and Stanislaus County in the whole state. Uh, certainly uh, water sales and water transfers are a very emotional and very uh, hot topic. We've all seen uh, that debate play out with the irrigation district mm -hmm. and, and uh, our local newspaper here for the, the past months. But more importantly, we also need to make decisions that long term provide stability and security for us. Right? And sometimes that means providing stability and security for those around you. Because if they have none, then uh, they will come uh, for what we have. And so you make an effort uh, for a collaborative uh, statewide solution, but of course we go up there protecting our interests first and foremost. Uh, let me give you an example. There's been, uh, for decades, the conversation about what we're going to do in the Delta. Mm -hmm. This is a pertinent issue in our race. Um, my opponents you know, brought up uh, on more than one occasion the water transfer and tried to make uh, the conversation, uh, the campaign about water, about water sales and water transfers. But the real important issue here is uh, stability uh, and security of, our, uh, of that resource. And if we don't have an investment uh, to deal with the Delta issue, if we don't put in uh, the canal or now the underground tunnels that the governor supported, uh, we can't move water uh, from the storage areas on the east side to the west side where some of the most fertile farming land uh, in the country is. You know, without a water conveyance or uh, transportation system, uh, you can't do that. So we've got to have somebody that supports making the investments again. I mean, these are important things. Um, you can't just say no uh, to infrastructure uh, and then expect the community to prosper. You know, uh, our, our grandparents' generation, my grandparents' generation, the greatest generation, that World War II generation, came home from the war and invested their time and their money into this country. They built uh, universities, canals, dams, all of the things that kind of laid the framework for prosperity for 50 years. Well, we got to re-up that investment uh, in those things. And it's important that whoever represents us understands water infrastructure, understands where water comes from and how it gets to where we need to do our farming, and understands how to protect it uh, for our valley. Do you think that we have sufficient water storage here in the state of California, or do you think no. that we need to build more dams or heighten the water level of the dams that we've already got? All of the above. Uh, you know, we've had a number of debates on this, and I've said, you know, we need to do, uh, the problem with the water debate is, you know, some folks say, oh, we got to just do conservation. The other folks, oh, we just got to build uh, more storage. Oh, we just got to raise the level of the current storage we have. Well, really, we need to do a little bit of all of the above. You know, we need more storage built. Uh, like I said, the population's growing, the needs are growing. Uh, we have to protect our agricultural 
uh, supply because it's literally the backbone of our economy, an economy that's at 18% unemployment right now. We certainly can't have that go higher, the uh, rates of poverty and despair here, uh, here locally. So we gotta, we've got to protect that water, but it's got to be done through increased conservation uh, efforts in the urban areas, increased storage, uh, raise the levels where we can. I know uh, Congressman uh, Denham and Congressman Cardoza and Congressman Costa have been all working uh, on that issue here locally to provide uh, additional storage in the short term. Uh, but we've got to work together collaboratively because you're not going to get a deal done. You know, there's not enough votes uh, just in the Central Valley uh, to steer water policy entirely. We have to work with the folks in the other areas. So we have to figure out how we can protect our water uh, and also secure other folks' needs uh, so they're not coming for our water. You've mentioned unemployment, the unemployment be, be, being 18, 19, 20 percent even in some yeah. places. Uh, is the position that you're running for District 21, is that a paid position? It is a paid position. My question to you as a potential politician and somebody who may get my vote tomorrow, mm -hmm. how tight are you willing to tighten your own belt for the greater good of the Californians here in the state? Oh, I think it's the first place you go. You know, I think uh, leadership starts right here at home. I've talked about that uh, during this campaign in respect to partisanship. Uh, as you know, we've talked on the radio a great deal, I've been on the TV show before, and uh, you know, I've expressed I am a, a moderate politician. I'm a Democrat, uh, but I've been supported by Republicans, by Democrats, by business folks, by labor folks, by firefighters, cops. The Republican sheriff of Stanislaus County has endorsed me uh, in my campaign because we've gone out with a message. Uh, you fixed partisanship right here by starting with yourself. You, know, you say, I'm not going to go up there uh, and vote the party line. I heard you in your earlier interview talking about party line mm -hmm. uh, politicians. Uh, you know, anyone who's voting party line, in my opinion, uh, isn't thinking. You know, you've got to be able to go up, uh, vote independently for your district and the needs of your district. And as you know, this is a diverse state, and this is a diverse country, and every district has very diverse needs. Uh, so to be able to go up and vote with one party or the other all the time uh, is not making a difference. And I guess uh, I would say the same thing when it comes to, you know, fiscal uh, discipline. You know, start right here. Set the example. Uh, don't overspend in, uh, in government. Don't overspend in the legislature. Uh, don't ask others to take pay cuts when you won't yourself take one. Speaking of voting party lines, there's a big concern, and it's all over the news, not just here, District 21, but I mean nationwide, with people who are receiving a lot of money and from different groups. The question is, when you get into office, say you get $1,000 or $10,000, doesn't really matter the amount dollar-wise, mm -hmm. but when you receive a bit of money from someone to further your campaign, how much are you under obligation to that organization or that person sometimes, an individual, once you are in office? I think you're under the same obligation to every single constituent in your district all the time. And that obligation is to listen. And that's true whether you're talking about a labor organization or a, a firefighters organization or a uh, you know, Joe Q citizen who's uh, called your office or written a letter perhaps about an issue they have. Uh, you're obligated to listen to everyone and spend as much time as you can to get all, gather all that information, all those different perspectives. And then you're obligated to make the best decision you can for your district and for the constituents uh, that you represent. Uh, but the idea that somehow uh, a campaign donation or an endorsement uh, obligates you uh, to vote a certain way, I think if that's your thinking, uh, you ought not be in public service because you've got to be able to go up and uh, take everybody's interests uh, into consideration when you go uh, to vote an issue. We have a few minutes left. Uh, go ahead and take your time, give your <laughs> campaign speech, and I, I'm sorry that I won't have time to upload this to YouTube for you, but this will re-air four more times over the next 24 hours, so people well, will wonderful. get a chance to see you. So go ahead, the, the show is yours. Well, I guess I'd just like to make one last appeal to voters out there. We've gotten to a place 
in politics in this era uh, where folks spend more time telling you who to blame for your problems than they do solving your problems. And when you go to vote tomorrow, I hope you'll support candidates and individuals who are willing to vote our community's interest first and foremost, not party politics, uh, not dogmatic, uh, same old, same old uh, flamethrowing politicians. Uh, you know, people can divide this country. Uh, people can say uh, that you should blame the other guy uh, for your problems. I think we should all uh, work together to solve our problems. We ought to wake up every morning and say, uh, what's wrong with my own party? How can I improve myself? How can I uh, make a difference uh, for my community? Uh, and if we all took that attitude and recognized our friends and our neighbors out there, you know, you don't walk out uh, your front door in the morning and look around your neighborhood and say, well, there's the Democrat, there's the Republican, and there's that Green Party person. Uh, you go out and those are your neighbors and your family. And I think uh, those are the kind of representatives we need. It's become too divisive in this country. Uh, we need folks that uh, will work together. And I guess I'm proud. Uh, you know, campaigns are important. And I'm proud of what we've accomplished uh, in this campaign. We've gotten the support uh, of Republicans and Democrats, of business and labor, uh, firefighters, farmers, cops. Uh, that's the kind of demonstrated ability to bring people together of all different uh, interests, of all different organizations, of all different parties. Uh, it's been an honor to get out there and meet all of you. Uh, we started this campaign by collecting 3,000 signatures to get on the ballot. Nobody had done that in over a decade in our community. We went door to door to do it. We've been going door to door ever since to talk to voters to find out what your needs are because it's together as a community that we govern. It's been wonderful to be on this show. It's been wonderful to be on the radio to visit with your listeners and your viewers. And I'm just honored uh, to have the opportunity to be on the ballot tomorrow to earn your trust uh, and your vote. Uh, and I commit to you that I will work hard to make a difference, to represent our community. Uh, you know, series where we are tonight has been a wonderful community to get to know. People have embraced me here. The entire city council and the mayor, all Republicans, by the way, have endorsed my campaign uh, because of the message I'm breaking, that we can work together, that we can make a difference. I'm extraordinarily proud of that. I've enjoyed shaking the hands of each and every one of you, uh, and I hope I've earned your vote tomorrow. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. You bet. Adam Gray for California State Assembly District 21. He was mentioning about being on the radio show. If you would like to hear some of those interviews, you can Google my name, and it will come up with blogtalkradio.com backslash Central Valley Hornet, and you can listen to some of those. Good night. Thanks for coming on the show, Adam.